So we're at the National Museum of Computing and what we're doing here is building a reconstruction of Cambridge University's first computer which is called the Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator. It's an important computer because it was the first one that was actually built for people to use to solve problems. It helped three groups of scientists in Cambridge win their Nobel Prizes and it was the first machine for which there was a programming system of the kind that a, a modern programmer would understand. There was a library of useful subroutines you wrote in a symbolic assembly code. Before that, people programmed machines by feeding things in through switches or just typing in the binary code of the instructions. The first machine was scrapped to make room for its successor. It's physically very large. A few bits and pieces ended up in museums, um, but most of it was lost. And indeed, very few of the circuit diagrams and none of the mechanical design drawings were kept. All that were retained were photographs and high-level descriptions. And so in doing the reconstruction, we've had to forensically analyse those photographs and work back from those to the, the circuits inside the machine. All the people who worked on it had a background on working in radar during the Second World War. And one of the key things about radar is it transmits pulses that bounce off an aircraft or a ship and reads them back. And of course, pulses are the basis of how a computer works in terms of counting. Um, so they'd already, from their radar work, understood how to make pulses, how to amplify them, how to count them, how to compare numbers represented as sequences of pulses. So they were on the, the threshold of computing and they use that expertise to build the, the EDSAT machine. The challenge really has been to get back to the original design. Obviously the photographs are very helpful, but they were taken throughout the nearly 10 years that the machine operated, and they improved the design a lot over that time. So knowing which photographs relate to the early machine is difficult. In terms of making the circuits work, this is a machine that comes out of a more analog view of electronics. Um, not such the clean ones and zeros that we're used to in the transistor world. And so it's a different way of thinking about electronic circuits. That's certainly given us some challenges. It's really helpful that in the volunteer team, we have people who worked on some valve computers at the start of their careers, or they worked on valve-based radar and radio systems for the Air Force, for example. And so we're tapping into what they learned as college students. Each of these units has got a, a, a set of fingers inside. If you come on this side, you can see it. The project is now nearly five years old. Um, the early stages were very much a feasibility study, doing a lot of research, finding out what documentation um, was around, and to see what we could still obtain in the ways of you know, these, these valves and so forth. It turns out they are still readily obtainable. Because they were used in things like military radar, there's a lot of surplus stock around and there are companies who sell that stuff. Then the next challenge was to recruit a volunteer team, um, particularly people who have the expertise to be able to recreate the designs of the circuits. And we're very fortunate, we've got four or five people with that expertise. The total volunteer team is now about 20 and the rest of the team are very much concerned with the, the construction. Compared to the pioneers, we have a great advantage. We can use modern computers to design EDSAC. So all this metal work is done using computer-aided design. And we send the computer drawings to a manufacturing company that happened to be in Cambridge, and they make all the parts to our drawings. Whereas with EDSAC, this all would have been handmade in the university workshops. Similarly with the circuits, all the circuits we have um, schematics of those on the computer. We can use computer simulations to check out the design of the circuits and in fact check out the logic of the whole machine. So we know we're building something that will eventually work. That wasn't a luxury that Maurice Wilkes and his team had in Cambridge in 1947 when they started. Many of the, the basic ideas you needed to generate pulses and so forth have been established in the world of radar. Um, the challenge was thinking about how to use those to build something that actually computes and scaling up to a system this large. There are about 3,000 valves in EDSAC, which makes it a very large and very complex system. Um, and so thinking through a machine that was that large, that had lots of different functional parts doing different jobs, that was really the challenge. It was a, a step up in complexity. But in terms of the basic circuit elements, um, a, a radar engineer of the 1940s would recognise the, the techniques we're using. We talk about things like cathode followers, flip-flops, that's a word that still exists in modern electronics. Those would all been things that a, a, an engineer of that time would have been aware of. 
In fact, we've just done a video about flip-flops. So the big difference in EDSAC is a flip-flop takes seven of these valves. And so if you think about a microchip in a modern computer, that's got thousands, maybe millions of flip-flops in it. On EDSAC, you can get about three flip-flops on one shelf of electronics. So they had to be much more economical in their design. So EDSAC was very much designed for numerical computation in the university. Um, to help physicists and mathematicians. Um, prior to EDSAC, they had to rely on hand calculators. There were a few manual um, mechanical calculators they could use, but that limited the size of problem they could work on just because it took so long to you know, work on a large matrix of numbers. EDSAC was so much faster, about 1,500 times faster, they could work on much bigger problems. And that changed the kind of science that could be done. So one example was radio astronomy. What um, EDSAC allowed Martin Ryle to do was to put a lot of small radio telescopes in a field, collect data from those small telescopes, which are easy to build, but then with the power of EDSAC, add all that data together as if it was a radio telescope the size of a field. Another area where EDSAC helped um, was with what's called X-ray crystallography which is working out the structure inside atoms and molecules. HEDSAC's input and output was very basic. It was five-hole paper tape. That was really the established medium for inputting any kind of data. This is what was used by the telegraph system and the, and the telephone systems. So you fed your data in and your program in as five-hole paper tape, and your answers came out on an online teleprinter as a table of numbers. Um, and because machine time was so limited and so valuable, you didn't waste time printing pretty headings or laying things out very neatly. Um, you kept everything very tight and very simple. Because the memory of the machine was so small, for a large calculation, you might break it into three pieces. The first piece would read the data into the main memory. Then you'd load a second program that would do the calculation on the data in the main memory. And then you load a third program that would pump the results out of the memory and put them on the teleprinter for you. And so they had to be quite cunning because although it was a huge advance in its time, it was in many ways quite a limited machine. The team who built it realized that making it easy to program the machine was gonna be one of the important factors influencing its, its usefulness. And so they very early on established a library of standard subroutines that packaged up calculations for useful mathematical functions that packaged up ways of organising work in the machine and doing the input and output. So typically, uh, once you knew what your numerical problem was, you picked the right library routines, you wrote a bit of what these days we call glue code to put those together, and then you had a working programme. And so non-specialists, or people from other areas like physics, engineering, mathematics, came to use EDSAC. Um, from the earliest days, they decided they weren't going to have specialist EDSAC programmers to solve people's problems rather than they would teach people how to use the machine because that was a more scalable way of getting the computing done. In terms of running EDSAC, the user turns up with their paper tape. Uh, we don't quite have it yet, but there'll be a start button there. <laughs> you press the start button, your paper tape reads in, and hopefully the teleprinter starts chattering. The need, obviously, with a valve machine like this, an experimental machine, is for engineers to maintain it. And so the mathematical laboratory has an engineering crew. Any working day, I'm sure there'll be three or four available, and you rely on them to check the machine at the start of the day. Um, the, the way the machine's memory worked, it needed regular adjustment, and so there'll be engineers around to help you with that. Um, they, they worked, as it were, a normal office day with engineers in support, and indeed later on there was an operator who ran programs for people just to get the faster flow of work through the machine. But if you were an approved user, you could work the machine at night um, until it went wrong, and then you had to kind of walk away and leave it for the engineers to fix in the morning. Was there an element of turn it off and turn it on again, do you think? Or was oh, I'm, sh I'm sure there was. Um, certainly, um, if you talk to some of the people who used the machines in those early days, there are all kinds of tales of, of little tricks. Um, apparently in the early days, the way you reset the memory was by wetting your finger and touching a, a terminal to uh, earth that part of the machine. Probably something modern health and safety wouldn't quite approve of. Some of these valves are coming out of boxes that are labelled 1943. So they've not been used, they were made we're in the 1940s. nowadays to having Macintoshes and Windows with everything provided for us and layers of software. In the early days, you were right near the bare metal. The ARM system in the first Archimedes would run reliably well above 100 degrees C. 